everyone. Um, I'm Amy Walsh. I uh, from Regions Hospital in St. Paul, and prior I am IEMPC 13 participant, and I'm uh, going to be moderating the discussion today about One World Schoolhouse. Um, first, I was hoping that we could get everyone that will be participating in the discussion to introduce themselves quickly. Um, so, Teresa, if you could go ahead and uh, start it off, that would be great. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Teresa Chan. I'm the sec one of the section editors, co-editor with uh, Nakia Yoshi um, at Allium for the book club. We're really excited to have this many people help joining us for our live book club. Uh, we're also very fortunate enough to have a lot of tech support from um, our esteemed colleague, um, Mr. Rob Roger, Dr. Rob Rogers, who's going to be um, helping us with the Nestivity um, pilot, where we're integrating some of this stuff with the online tweetcast. Um, and so maybe I'll hand it over to him to uh, talk next. I'm coming in from Hamilton in Canada, um, near McMaster University. Rob, do you want to introduce yourself? Hey guys, Rob Rogers uh, from the University of Maryland, and um, I'm just happy to be joining this esteemed group of educators, and I'm just writing the coattails of giants here. Uh, I'll go next. I'm Brent Toma. I'm a emergency medicine hey, resident Brent. from Canada, and I'm currently living in Boston doing a simulation fellowship. I do some editing at Allium as well. And Jordana? Hi, I'm Jordana Haber. I'm in Brooklyn, New York. I work at Maimonides Medical Center, and I'm an education fellow, and I'm excited to be joining the group, participating in the book club meeting with people across the country and Canada as well. Exciting. And Robert? And I'm Rob Cooney from Johnstown, Pennsylvania, Associate Program Director at our little hospital here, and I'm happy to be joining you guys talking about one of my favorite topics, flipped education. Excellent. Um, well, next, Teresa, if you wouldn't mind uh, telling us a little bit more about how this collaboration between ALIEM and um, IEMTC came to be. Um. All right. So it sounds like um, I think a good bunch of the folks from ALIEM decided to go and uh, take this wonderful teaching course that's hosted um, by Rob and his team. And I think that there was a lot of discussions that were had at that time about how, you know, what the future of medical education might look like. And I think that um, a bunch of us had been reading this book, um, and at some point, Amy, I think you're the one that first suggested it, but I think a lot of it, us had been very excited to hear about this book being published. Um, and I think at some point, uh, Rob said, hey, why don't we link up and do something? And I think that's super cool. So, I, I, I mean, I think it really, re really is in fitting with the book itself that we're kind of collaborating across not quite the world, but definitely across the continent, and I think that that speaks a lot to kind of the, where the future of um, this kind of education might look like, especially in the world of medicine. Excellent. And uh, Rob, if you could tell us a little bit about a few things. Um, first, uh, IEMTC coming up this spring, um, and I teach EM, and then the Nestivity platform um, that we'll be using for this discussion. Yeah, well, that's, that's a lot to talk about, and unfortunately, I worked last night. Um, otherwise, I had plans to use, if you can get it in the screen here, my new Google Glass. Can wow. you see that? <laughs> yeah, I was I was playing around with it um, in and out of sleep, and I, I decided I didn't have time to pilot it. So, um, so a whole bunch of stuff going on. We have the teaching course uh, in Baltimore, Maryland. We're now on our third session. We have a course coming up in April. We had our first course in 2012, the second in November of 2013, and then now we're going to have two courses this year with really big name speakers. We had Michelle Lynn out last year. We've got Chris Nixon, Joe Lex, and then you know the faculty that uh, are at Maryland like Amal Matu and myself, Terry Mulligan. So this course came um, sort of about the same time that Solomon Khan's book came out, and I'm sure we'll talk later about um, education with kids, but um, the idea for this course was that we needed uh, an education course that was uh, both cutting edge and was along the lines of the theme of the flipped classroom. So uh, the course continues to grow. We're now on our third course coming up in April, and we're trying more and more to do uh, material before the course. I know Amy was just at the course, and hopefully she's got good things to say about it. 
Um, but uh, I sort of model the course after Solomon Khan's ideas and my own experience with my kids. And so hopefully the course gets bigger and better uh, every time we have it. And I expect every single one of you at some point to come to the course. <laughs> that, that means Definitely you well, well worth the trip. So. Um, excellent. Well, I'll go ahead and just uh, briefly summarize the book for anyone who hasn't had a chance to read it yet, and then we'll go ahead and get into the discussion questions. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so first, Salman Khan um, just kind of describes the inspiration behind the Khan Academy. He was working with his cousin on tutoring her in math, and she was a bright student but was struggling, and initially they were doing one-on-one -on -one tutoring, um, but he wasn't really able to keep up with that, so he started making videos. And it turned out that she actually kind of preferred them to working with him one-on-one. -on -one. And so that started him challenging, that challenged him to rethink some of the assumptions that he had made about what ways to educate were the best. And as he started thinking about that, he started making more of these videos and people from throughout the world started becoming very engaged in them. And it's really kind of snowballed from there. Um, after the success of the website, he's also had some success with integrating this into more formalized education curriculums. And they've been able to really kind of shift the way that things are done, that you know, using a lot smaller but more efficient use of time on lecture then allows for more active, engaged learning um, in the classroom and allows for more free time activity outside of the classroom as well um, to give a better balance in wellness. Um, and then from there, he's kind of cha challenged the views not only of how to do primary and secondary education, but also has a vision for um, university and professional education as well. Um, and I think that, lastly, as someone with interest in international medicine, one of the things that really um, stood out to me was his view of a world-class education for anyone, anywhere. And I know one of the critiques of this has been the lack of access to technology for some people, but he did provide some kind of constructive solutions for how to get access to technology to really allow um, for this to be something that could happen anywhere in the world though there is definitely some infrastructure and technology challenges that still need to take place to make that happen. Um, so with that, I think we'll go ahead and get into our discussion questions. And the first question I would put out to all of you is either how do you or how would you customize medical education? Um, for myself, um, I mentioned it somewhat on the website, but I think that what the flipped classroom really offers us is the opportunity to, um, to really allow students to be more creative, to take a deep dive into topics that they're passionate about. So I, I could see a way of um, you know, starting medical education with an orientation with a lot of simulation and kind of those core lectures that you just kind of have to have to understand, but quickly moving into clinical rotations where you are um, incorporating these lectures kind of specific to each of the clinical rotations and really having a lot more clinical time. But then also one thing I would be really excited about and I think would um, increase professional satisfaction and efficiency for mentors, but also really increase creativity and experience for learners would be to um, have either like a health policy, a time where you spend six months working on a piece of legislation that's really important to you or diving deep into a research topic or something like that. Um, and so maybe Rob, if you could kind of tell us a little bit about your thoughts as well. Uh, there's two Robs, so oh, I, think, I was uh, going to say, why don't we ha hear from Robert, uh, who's actually doing a lot of flipped EM stuff. Um, and uh, maybe he can kind of add his two cents because I think that segues into some of the work he's been doing. So for the last six years I've been fortunate enough to be part of a residency that has pretty much 100% flipped curriculum. We've managed to reduce the live lecture to about 14 hours annually and wow. the rest of it's delivered via uh, independent reading. So it's actually a low-tech flip if you will. We don't do a whole lot of videos 
although our next iteration is going to incorporate more video and more podcast technology. And we took the national curriculum, broke it into modules, and you have to treat your learners a little bit differently. When they come out of medical school, we put them in a track and they get that foundational knowledge. But as they go through their training, they're given more leeway to choose their track and kind of delve into those topics that interest them more or delve into tracks that they feel their knowledge is weak on. And so it's worked really well, and it's been very positive. And initially, it wasn't quite as well uh, received, but after about half a year, everybody didn't want to go to any other format. It was kind of neat to see the process change. Yeah. That's really exciting stuff. How do you see the new technologies kind of fitting in um, to your existing schedule now? I think it will allow a little bit more customization from the learner perspective. Not everybody wants to read 100 pages of journal articles a week. That's kind of our current structure. Uh, so allowing them to choose to watch a video or to listen to somebody will kind of go to their learning preferences. It will also allow them to pace their learning a little bit more. They don't have to sit in one place and do the reading. Some of the other things that we're working on, too, one of our residents has taken an interest in audience response this year, and so we're doing a lot more incorporation of quizzes into the learning as well. Uh, we're trying not to quite cover the, the topic of the day, though, because I think it would kind of skew the results of the quizzes. So he has free reign to just choose in-service topics at his leisure. <laughs> That's exciting. All right, Brent, if you want to... Yeah, I'm just... I'm just following the Twitter chat here too, and uh, Natalie, Nat, sorry, Nadia Awad commented and mentioned that we should start early in med ed, and that this should be easy to do with core material in medicine. And I think she's really got a point there in, in terms of incorporating the uh, flipped classroom concepts. The medical education standard stuff that gets taught from year to year really doesn't change. So in terms of incorporating new technology and flipping the classroom, I really don't know why we couldn't do a better job of building these resources and sharing them annually. Like, do we really need to have 150 or 100 and some heart failure lectures put together every year by physicians across North America and, and the world, really? Could we not have them better use their time in more interactive modalities and discussions and have a few people making amazing lectures and content that can be shared? And I, I don't know, I think that's a great place to start for it. I, I can see its application in EM education as well, but EM education is uh, much more fluid and changing, and the literature comes into it. Really explaining the basics of physiology and stuff, that doesn't change a whole lot from year to year, and I think we could use we could start there um, and really get all the med students on before we really get into the residency programs as well. Yeah, Salman Khan mentioned in his article in Academic Medicine kind of having a format like um, like Yelp or the thumbs up, thumbs down on YouTube where you could probably with, you know, have five or six different lectures and kind of really get the cream to rise to the top pretty quickly um, with a system like that. Jordana, what do you think? So we're actually using a flipped classroom for the last year and a half where I am at Maimonides and I would call it a low-tech flipped classroom. We seem to be averse to technology. I'm actually the most technology advanced one of them in our program, and as you can see, that's not something I'm very skillful with. But I think the low tech works really well where we are. We basically took our curriculum too and um, decided that we want when the learners come to conference for them to be informed learners and to be engaged participants. And I think a lot of what we do is following um, with Khan's vision that. Uh, learners need to take responsibility for their own learning. That's really the only way true education takes place. And if you don't have learners learning to learn and actually choosing to learn and deciding um, what material they're going to use, then there's um, you can't really see if actual learning is taking place through the old lecture format. So we found this works really well. A problem or sort of a challenge that we've come up with is we get asked often, how are you assessing that, the success of a flipped classroom. And I think that's a really interesting topic, especially as we talk about evidence-based education, is looking for good outcome tools. And um, 
I think, you know, that's something that I know in the education world that we're all trying to improve upon is looking for these better outcomes. Yeah, Teresa? Yeah, so I was going to speak up on that a little bit. I think one of the biggest challenges right now is to decide what it is that we're trying to assess. I mean, I think one of the big things that we can be looking to is to see if Really, the flipped classroom in many ways, it depends on the, what you're trying to teach. And so if you're trying to teach skill sets, then you might need to look at workplace-based assessment. You might need to look at outcomes in SIMS and OSCEs. Whereas if you're going to be talking about knowledge base, well, then you know what? Exactly what Robert's doing over at his shop with the um, interactive quizzing um, in training exams, that's probably going to be actually the best way to check for knowledge translation um, and actually um, see if uh, people are actually retaining the material. Um, I think that what you, where we're getting into a whole other domain is the idea of point of care and flipped assessment, where the assessment drives some of the learning and maybe steers teachers towards teaching things that they might not otherwise think about um, uh, teaching or assessing and that's actually something we're working on here at McMaster is that we're kind of in some ways flipping the assessment paradigm so we're doing a whole bunch of point of care assessments about uh, clinical work and then uh, providing really good tools that actually force a uh, feedback and assessment uh, arc within that kind of assessment to be able to get people to pay attention to certain things that we traditionally don't look at um, and that um, my learners might not get feedback about. So that's kind of one thing that we're working on is actually taking that a little bit further. All right, and uh, Rob Rogers, um, if you have any further thoughts on um, how you customize or what's on your wish list to customize in medical education in the future. Well, um, I'm just following you smart people and all your smart ideas. Um, our residency, we've got kind of a hybrid between low-tech and high-tech. Um, I, I think the mistake is uh, many people think you've got to get really well-constructed YouTube videos and all this multimedia stuff. Um, I think that's cool, but learners actually have to go to it, and it has to be good. And so my, I start very, very basic, and I base most of what I do on on my kids and um, the concept of the flip classroom is actually not new at all it's been around for probably 30 years but the the con book sort of brought it back to the surface and I think people have have looked at the Khan Academy website and and looked at his book and I've read the book twice and I, I think it's there's sort of been a revolution in education and and most of us have just been hit with what the hell have we been doing for the past several years with uh, live lectures, and I'm impressed by 14% live lectures. Is that what you said, Robert? Uh, uh, even less, 14 yeah. hours. And I, I think, I mean, that's that's impressive. I, we have a lot more than that, and you know, we do interaction. We do, um, you know, we do reading. I mean, I don't think reading an article before lecture is necessarily flipping anything. I think that's just preparing for a discussion. But the problem is, it ends up deteriorating into another lecture, and and so my, my thoughts about how to do this is, I, I think, um, as Brent mentioned, I mean, you just got to start and got to get out there and, and see what works. Um, again, we're sort of hybrid between low and, and high tech. Um, but I think the more that you can, even with adults, I mean, it's true for my kids, um, but the more you can interact in, you know, for, if there's a heart fit, uh, an ENT session, for example, I went to an ENT residency review lecture about a month ago and the speaker was great and it's a very smart faculty member but it essentially just deteriorated into a 60-minute lecture on ENT emergencies and I thought that was the worst possible way to spend the time of a bunch of residents and some faculty learning about how to take care of ENT emergencies. Um, the better way to do it would be to review before you got there, look at procedures and then go through some you know crashing patients with ENT emergencies. So, um, I'm sort of new to this. I mean, I'm looking for ideas as well, but I, I think um, the more we do this, the better. And uh, the key thing here about fo foam and, and what we're doing here on the Tweetcast is is uh, sharing ideas and not not duplicating work. Um, there's a lot to be done, but there's a lot of smart people on this talk right now, and I think the more we share and the more we spread it um, is just one little start to get education changing. I think you brought up a really important point, and that's that a lot of people look at flipping education as creating these technological videos or podcasts and just sending them out to the learners. 
and they forget that the more important component is that time that you then spend together to assess the learning and build upon the, the foundational right. knowledge. Yep. It, to take your example of ENT emergencies, we did that about three months ago, and so we brought our nosebleed box down, we sat our learners around the table, we went through all the contents of the box, we played with the instruments, and then we took up an intubation head that I put a uh, line into the back of the, the nose, and we practiced doing a posterior nosebleed pack, we practiced with all the anterior tools, etc. So it takes that knowledge that you just read, and then the hands-on skills and puts them together so that hopefully the next time you see this patient in real life, you'll be able to handle it more confidently. That sounds really, really cool and really enriching. I think that, you know, one of the big challenges with nosebleeds as an example is kind of having that approach that you develop. And at least for myself, I find that, um, you know, if you're not an excellent lecturer, it can be really hard to convey that approach. But when you're kind of working through it hands-on yourself, it can it sticks better anyway. Yeah. Um, I'm impressed so also with the creative... Um, tools that many people here are using and getting to hear them through the phone world over the last year. I think like this like, concept of sharing and not recreating the wheel has worked really well for many of us. Um, I think going back to what Khan's talking about and using, you know, being creative in the way we teach really comes back to sort of um, student-centered learning where we're sort of spending more time diagnosing our learners and deciding what are their needs, how do we get them to reach a higher level, what's the gap, what are they missing, and trying instead of to generalize what we're teaching, trying to individualize for each learner what it is that they need, which might be different for each learner, and kind of spending more time doing that than on a, a general lecture. And I think I'm trying to, um, at uh, CORD last year, the keynote speaker mentioned this, a quote that I thought was really effective was that we need to standardize the outcome, which is to reach certain goals of competency and on that spectrum of reaching expertise, but at the same time individualize the training. And I think using that flip class room really allows us to reach those goals. I think it was NASA, right, who was the keynote speaker for it. Yep. Yeah, I, I love that thought of individualizing and customizing. I was just kind of thinking in Twitter terms of wanting to favorite and retweet you on that part. Um, and I think it sounds like we're all pretty much big flipped classroom um, believers, um, but what drawbacks have you either experienced or do you foresee with using a flipped classroom or asynchronous learning system? Well, I can start with that. Um, my, I don't think it's a drawback, but I think it's, um, it's a change in culture. And anytime you change the educational culture, you have to change the, the expectations that the learners are being brought up in. And everybody expects the same thing for the most part. They expect lectures, they expect homework and articles and books. And so for our medical students, for example, um, I think it's great. And I, I think that this w can work really well. But um, okay. my experience so far has had a, a few little bumps in the road. And, and that is if you give them these these wonderful assignments, you know, YouTube videos, or you even create stuff, some of them just don't do it, or they don't understand that they really should do it before the session begins. They're, they're used to just sort of skimming stuff and showing up for the talk. Mm -hmm. If you truly flip it, I think you really have to set their expectations that this is a change in the educational culture. These are yeah. the goals. We're not going to sit and lecture for 60 minutes on, on, on how to evaluate chest pain. We're going to talk about cases. So you you know you got to you got to you got to do the homework and I, I found that with some of the people who uh, came to the international teaching course they didn't quite understand the concept of how to get people to actually do the work because it is a little bit of work and I think um, one thing I've learned is flipping the classroom is not giving them a 60 minute video of a lecture um, to do it well they should be really relatively short videos if you're going to do a video at all short videos decent speaker you know interactive somehow but it needs to be good and short and keep their attention span because if they're long and they're sort of just another lecture but it's a pre-lecture many of them get bored of it and they they just they won't do the work they won't do the flip and then they show up they're not prepared to, right. to do the discussion so I think you have to set the tone and prepare and, ch and they you have to change the culture because they're just not used to that I don't think 
it's a little bit. Right. <clears throat> yeah, so I think I, I totally agree with that. I think the priming, I, that's what I'd call it, is just priming your learners. That's super important, and it is a culture change and a shift from what they're used to. I actually remember when I was in medical school, I had a, uh, a teacher, maybe he was a bit before his time, but he tried doing stuff like this, and my class's response to this was like, what do you mean? Like, we have a test tomorrow in another class, we didn't do our reading, we didn't do anything, and it, it just really fell flat. And in retrospect, I look at that and I'm like, what what failed was that we hadn't been had that set up to to, to explain how the learning is going to work and how it's going to be different and what the expectations for w were for that and why and i don't think without that that with out making that culture shift this can this can really succeed as just kind of one off things and i really like what robert's talking about because it sounds to me like you've sort of progressively integrated more and more of this stuff and as people have learned what's expected and how effective it is it becomes more successful so yeah. I, I really like that point and I think the priming is super important one of the other things is the culture promotes itself uh, we found that certain learners will try to get by with skimming the material or skipping the material and the way that our discussions are structured they almost always get caught and we <laughs> We, we did a qualitative study looking at their um, attitudes towards the learning and expectations and that was one of the questions we asked was towards their motivation and what motivates them to read and several times it showed up that the embarrassment of getting caught in front of their peers drives them to continuously participate from there on. So peer pressure is a wonderful thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and Teresa? Yeah, one of the flipped classroom modules that I put together was actually just for I I I did it, I do it just for our first years, and so the idea is to hit them when they're just coming in, and so that it probably becomes a little bit part of the uh, the the culture there. And the way I that I do it is actually I make it a bit of a competition. So over the course of a month, they have uh, some modules have to work through, and then I tell them the culminating activity is actually that they have to flip the classroom back at me. Um, and prepare a, a, a what what they lecture or um, a presentation back um, in their teams, um, and so it's always upper GI bleed versus lower GI bleed, and they always have fun team names, um, and so that's uh, that's that, so they know that they're uh, they're accountable for the material and, and conveying it because a big part of it is going to be that they're going to be teaching their peers, um, and then they're also assessed. So I think that that helps a fair bit as well in terms of motivation because nothing there's nothing like peer pressure to change behavior for sure. <laughs> there's ample studies on that. <laughs> yeah, one of our goals in our program is really to focus more our outcome, which yeah, we have to find a good way of assessing, is really to develop skills of lifelong learning. And these are really in our milestone assessments. If you, when we look at the milestones, really some of the things that we're trying to assess in our learners is that they're developing skills of lifelong learning, that they can self-assess, develop a learning plan for themselves. And so I think uh, the flipped classroom really allows us to do that where we can see if our learners or residents, if they're able to um, take responsibility for their own learning and become teachers. And that's really part of your training is to learn to also become a good teacher so you can teach you know, for the next generations and continue your learning really beyond residency. So I think part of our job as educators in uh, the medical education world or clinical medicine is to give them skills for continuing learning in medicine and sort of, I think a big part of that's just inspiring learners, showing them that we continue our own learning, that we're constantly looking for groups like this or um, uh, continue, developing ways to continue our own practice and education beyond residency. Um, great, and uh, Brent, did you have another comment for us? I think Teresa was wanted to wanted to give her. All right. Well, one of the big things that we've been talking about is that motivation piece, and I think that one of the great things that we have on deck is it's almost like a planned it sort of. Um, <laughs> actually, we're we obviously have an interest in education and continue in medical education. So one of the uh, things that the book club's been trying to find is books that kind of make you think about what we do and 
how we educate people in medicine a little bit differently. And so, actually, next month's going to be a book that Brent picked, uh, and it's called Drive by uh, Dan Pink. And uh, it's about intrinsic motivation and the, and um, how you kind of change that culture that we've been talking about and change that perspective on learning. Uh, it sounds like what Robert's been doing over uh, uh, set up is really just change. Cha he's successfully done that, just change that culture. And I think that that's what we're kind of glancing on, so I think that it, it'll be very interesting to integrate that part into uh, the next book club. Um, and um, But uh, what we can do now, I think, maybe, Amy, is we should probably wrap up, because like we all have been saying, that when we flip things, we shouldn't go on for hours and hours, <laughs> but rather keep it short and sweet. We may stay online separately and chat more, because I think we're all very excited to be chatting with each other, But uh, and we'll definitely all tune in. Um, but maybe, Amy, do you want to take us through final thoughts? Yeah, great. Um, well, it's been really fascinating to hear from all of you your experiences with flipping the classroom and your perspectives on it. I myself haven't had a lot of experience in it, so a lot of my notions are kind of more in the idealistic pie-in-the-sky realm of things. Um, so uh, I'd like to just kind of pitch it back to you and see it, um, if you guys have any closing thoughts on what you think kind of are the most important next steps that kind of the way forward with this. So maybe um, uh, Rob Cooney, if you could get us started. So I think education is increasingly going to move in this direction, especially as user-created content continues to expand, things like foam, but our learners are going to continue to come in with gaps that we'll need to discover. And I think the only way to really do that is to put them on a, a fairly rigorous curriculum and have them interact with it and interact with each other. And then it's up to us as educators to come up with methods to move them up Bloom's hierarchy, if you will. So they'll come in with the base knowledge, but we want to work on the analyzing, the applica application, and um, ultimately the creation together. Great. And uh, Rob Rogers? Yeah, I, I think moving forward we need to just keep having this discussion and, and spreading this um, to any corner of the, the globe we can. And I think that starts on Twitter and, and what we're doing right now. I think the more we talk about it, the more we perfect it, the more tools we share without reinventing the wheel that eventually this is going to catch on. And, um, you know, I think like Ken Robinson talks about with changing education, eventually... Um, Eventually, it's going to change, and I think we just got to keep keep plugging away and being leaders in this, and it's going to happen. All right, and Jordana, I'm going to interrupt before we get to you because we did have a question from Twitter that I'd like to put to all of you guys. Um, the question was, um, can flipped classroom help with the move toward competency by design rather than competency by time? Um, that question was from Ali Jalali. Um, and maybe if we can start with Brent on that and kind of work our way back through. Yeah, I think that this is absolutely one part of that puzzle, and it's a great uh, summary question to, to tie things up, really. Uh, I think the flipped classroom can certainly play a role in that because it can let learners uh, gain competency a little bit easier at their own rate and spend more time on their own and help them to know what they need to do. But I think part of that, we, what we need to add in there is the competency-based assessment piece. Uh, along with an, a better understanding of what motivates medical students and how to, how to get them self-motivated to do that. And I think those things are all related and some of the things that we're going to be discussing next month as well. So that's my take on it. I think it's, it's one part of, of a lot of changes that will need to happen as we move towards competency-based med ed. Great. Um, any other thoughts that you have, Jordana? Um, I think that was a great comment to make on that concept. You know, that's something that from this book that I put into question is really, like, do we have to have that time? There's really, we have a limited amount of time during residency. And I think that's actually one of um, the barriers we face in sometimes implementing this uh, student-focused type of curriculum um, is probably time is one of our biggest challenges, is that we have goals that we expect residents to reach or medical students to reach in a certain amount of time. 
but I think this will allow us for a more um, competency by design approach, which I think will benefit our learners and make for a better experience. Excellent. And any other thoughts that you have, Teresa? Um, no, I think uh, everybody, everybody said some great stuff, and I think that uh, I'd really love to have everyone come back and um, enjoy the book club with us next month when we handle um, the, uh, the next book, which is Drive, because I think a lot of uh, where we're headed with getting people to change the culture and to change the way they do their learning and to really motivate people to keep going and uh, assist with the learning of in their own independent way, like everyone has been saying throughout this uh, this uh, Google Hangout Live has been uh, has been exactly the kind of stuff that we need to talk about. Um, and so I think that I'm really excited to see um, what we continue to come up with. And I think that a great place to continue this conversation is both on Twitter with the hashtag Allium Book, but also to um, uh, I invite you to comment on the blog, and we'll be posting all of this on there as well. And um, Brent and I and Nikita love it when people engage with us on the blog and uh, write lots of comments. Um, so we look forward to engaging everyone, and I hope that everyone here today has had um, a chance to kind of uh, wax philosophical and try to push our field forward, because I think there's a lot to grow, and I'm really excited to have heard from everyone here today. So thank you very much. and. Uh, we will tune, you guys could tune in next time. And thanks so much to Rob for uh, getting involved uh, from your point of view. Rob, do you have some closing thoughts as our, one of our guests? No, I just wanted to say it took me the entire hangout to get my banner at, my banner name at the bottom of the screen. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm that's there. my goal. And I also guys. wanted to comment, um, Robert, is that your um, level of uh, basketball um, skill, That uh, the goal behind you there? <laughs> Got it. <laughs> that you're, that's, that's about my level too. So no, yeah. it, it's been fun. I'd be be glad to get involved and do more of this. I, it's fantastic. Well, excellent. Um, I would like to give one more uh, testimonial to uh, IEMTC. It was a transformational experience for me as far as kind of engaging with this really um, inspiring and engaged community of educators. Um, and just want to thank everyone one more time for uh, tuning in um, and for contributing to a great discussion. Um, thanks a lot. Thanks for leading it. Great job. Well, thank you. All right. So um, thank you very much for everybody, and we will uh, have you guys come back again next month. Bye. Bye. All right.